Thompson. On the show today, we have two fabulous people from the advisory group here to advise us on all things financial when it comes to an investment. Welcome to Property Matters. Welcome along to another week, and if you've tuned in live, then it's that fabulous thing of knowing there's a public holiday on Friday. Hopefully you're doing something special for Matariki with you and your family, uh, although short weeks, they tend to sort of create the workload, because we've still got to fit five days in, but let's nab it, because the next one's not until the end of October. If you're tuning in via our podcast at a different time, then sorry, it might not be a public holiday this week, but remember you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple and Samsung song iHeartRadio and on YouTube or wherever you'd like to get your podcast. And thank you. I've been seeing some amazing comments coming up on some of our YouTube podcasts lately. Really love it when our listeners give us feedback. So thank you very much. And you can follow us at Property Matters Radio on Facebook as well. Now absolutely delighted to welcome back Arman Chand from the advisory group, but he wasn't with the advisory group when we last caught up with him a little while ago. Welcome back great to have you here thank you thank you it's uh, it's been a long time but it's uh, great to be here lovely to have you here and you've brought along a colleague Rafe Williams welcome to the show hi yeah thanks for having me on Look, it's great to have you both here and Aman you've got a really good memory because before we came on air he remembered that last time he was here was an episode we did with two brand new first home buyers telling their their journey as teachers in education and having to get a house and uh, you'll be pleased to know they're both still in education and doing very very well indeed which is awesome yeah, it was quite interesting because I do recall um, back then there were challenges getting into your first home. Yeah. And hey, fast forward a few more years, <laughs> we've got similar issues. <laughs> Different challenges, but still <laughs> plenty of challenges. Yeah. So look, before we unpack your job, your work, and we're going to talk all sorts of things financial, let's talk about you first. So um, tell us a little bit about your journey. What's your career looking like? My career since I graduated, I started working in a CA practice, chartered accounting practice. Yeah, that's back in 1996. Yeah, that reveals my age. <laughs> so I started at, in Fungare, uh, a very nice small practice back then, Grant Thornton. And after a few years there, I moved to the mighty Waikato. Unfortunately, they were not so mighty. Um, this weekend. <laughs> um, and during my days in Fungare and Waikato, um, different accounting practices, uh, different industry. Uh, it was great because there were smaller parts of the country, very beautiful parts of the country, and gave me some good exposure to, you know, some of the industries that, uh, you know, being labeled as the backbone of New Zealand, like farming and agriculture. Mm. So in addition to the experience that I've got now, I've got some good historical knowledge, which are still relevant today in terms of agriculture and um, uh, accounting and taxation issues around that, which is a separate story. Mm. Um, then I moved to Auckland back uh, a long time ago, 2000. My wife got a job here, so I just do what most husbands do, just follow her uh, to the mighty Auckland. Wise and, man. And, uh, well, it's been good. Uh, good. Well, at least it was a good outcome last uh, weekend with the Super Rugby, uh, with the drought over. Uh, so that since then, I've been um, floating around various accounting practices, and I'm currently a client director at the advisory group. So what does that mean? What's the client director? What's your role? My role is... Um, uh, it's it's kind of split in the middle, looking after staff, firstly, uh, from an office perspective, getting juniors to uh, uh, any any staff below my level, making sure that they're doing what they're doing, they're enjoying what they're doing, they're growing uh, in what they're doing uh, along the way. So we do have graduates, so it is my responsibility or our responsibility to make sure, you know, there is a career plan for them and not just you know, your traditional boring accounting job. And then on the flip side, which is the more important thing is client management, you know, looking after our clients, make sure they're served, uh, what they need, uh, communicate with them. So avoid surprises, um, (laughs) you know, uh, keeping them happy. Yeah. Brilliant. Sounds like some variety in that mix, which is good. Yes, there's a variety. It can be challenging. <laughs> uh, finding staff is very hard at the moment, is uh, within many other uh, outfits. Mm. Um, so uh, always uh, 
open to new stuff and um, and networking is quite important which is quite good at the moment you know after after the covid days it was very hard to get back into the networking yeah. side there so mm. you know we met first yeah, <laughs> before yeah. covid and now we're meeting after covid yeah, funny <laughs> eh okay and raf tell us your career journey take us back back <laughs> take you back 10 years <laughs> um, that's how long i've been in this um industry for um graduated in 2014 from Auckland uni um and yeah got my first job um in a sole practice practitioner firm mm-hmm. um which is very good uh it was out out west uh northwest um and just really learned how to do basic accounting because what they teach you at uni doesn't actually apply in the real job. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, so I, I um, grew out west, really, um, which was good. Um, some big firms out west, uh, UHY, uh, where I spend most of my time. And then floated around, uh, moved to the shore, and then uh, settled down in Newmarket for a bit. Um, and grew there at Newmarket, which was great. It's one of the, uh, the better roles, I would say. Mm-hmm. And then... Recently joined the advisory group um, as a senior manager and then got promoted to associate director, okay. um, which was um, very exciting. And yeah, just loving my time currently at the advisory group. And what does your role entail then as an associate director? Uh, similar to Roman, um, you're looking after staff, their needs, um, their challenges, um, spending a lot of time with them, helping them grow. Um, and yeah, you really want to help help them and develop them um, and, and nurture as well. And then on the other side is uh, looking after clients, um, just trying to be proactive really, and that's what you want. So clients can then come to you with any issues they have, um, they feel comfortable talking to you and um, you can just assist with any problems they have. And, you know, just, just before this, I had a client that um, told me that it was nice to have someone being proactive um, mm-hmm. with his accounts and it was nice to hear. You don't get yeah, much yeah. positive feedback sometimes in the job, but that was good. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's good to be on the, the front foot with clients and that's how I tend to, to work. Brilliant. Um, and, yeah, the broad ranges that I kind of cover. Um, so... Um, been doing a lot of uh, space in the cryptocurrency uh, markets at the moment, um, which is always interesting. Mm. Um, and then, you know, retail, uh, construction, overseas businesses, um, and then servicing high net worth individuals, which is always a challenge, even though people think it's very easy. <laughs> um, and, yeah. Cool. Mm. And tell us a little bit before we sort of delve into the financial side, what or who is the advisory group? Obviously, we've got a sense of you two, but as a company, who are they? Uh, so I'll take this. Um, it's an advisory group. Um, they were founded back in 2006. Um, we have three awesome directors. Um, we've got Sadir Lala, Martin um, Henderson and Graham Lawrence. Um, we've got Graham's palm. Um, part of the uh, tax department um, which he founded in 2022 so it's he's been a great addition to the firm so any complex tax issues that we may have we can always just run to the tax department mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which is very handy because you know it's not property is especially not mm-hmm. easy um and um i believe the firm's grown since then um we sit at around 20 20 to th- 25 to 30 employees yeah um which is very nice so it's all hands-on really um Anything you want to add, Mark? No, um, I, we've got a good mix at the top, if you like. You know, so we've got um, um, Martin, and um, you know he's a very good in the business advisory space. Uh, we've got Graham, like what Rev said, in the tech space, and then we've got Sudhir, who's very good in the M and A space. Mm-hmm. So uh, mergers and acquisitions. So um, the firm itself was founded back in two thousand and six and it has grown to where we are now um and um you know with recent acquisitions like ref and myself um at that level to it just kind of demonstrates the growth they're facing um the client base have shifted uh from you know uh, your traditional um, accounting practices you know nowadays we get more complex uh, clients mm-hmm. offshore clients um, different structures 
and uh, very transactional issues as well. You know, right. how, how do you deal with this particular aspect right. of it there? So um, having those three skill set at the top is quite good. Mm. Uh, my experience coming into here is varied as well. I am very strong in tax myself and I've got the business advisory side to it. So mm. when I'm doing your normal compliance work mm. uh, from a um, client's perspective, like end of the year accounts. So, you know, suddenly I'll be throwing my tax hat as well. Mm. You know, what's missing? How can we make the best of this? You know, is there any opportunities to minimize tax? Uh, so all that starts coming in. Um, Rev has got more business advisory experience, um, you know, including forecasting. Um, and like you said, new ways of doing things like cryptocurrency. Yeah. So the top level is quite wide. Um, you know, we've got a lot of experience. Uh, and um, what that does make us is we can provide good quality services, mm. you know, without uh, big overheads, if you like. Yeah. Mm. Does the government and our tax department consider cryptocurrency you know, the same as any other currency when it comes to, well, you've earned it this way, so you need to pay tax on it, etc. Uh, the government have a very um, strong approach on it yeah. at the moment. Um, yeah, it's kind of, um, they're tra- treating it like a, what you'd call trading stock. Um, right. Where they, they basically just take a starting point and assuming that you've bought it with the intention to resell it at some point. And their, their view yeah. that comes around with that is say, well, if you bought a cryptocurrency, what income can you earn from it? Um, while you're holding it, mm. and back then, back some, when crypto became the thing, <laughs> um, there was nothing else. The only way you could right. actually get cash out is to sell it. So what IRD mm. has done is said, well, clearly the only way to make money out of this is to sell it, and it, you'll generally sell it when the prices justify the sale. Yeah, yeah. So you bought it uh, with an intention of resale, similar to gold. Like, yeah. why would mm. you buy gold? Because no one, like if you buy a bare piece of land, at least you could give it, lend it out for mm. grazing, mm. if you like, or build a house on it and rent it out. But the whole crypto space has changed over the last few years. You know, now you could buy crypto on which you could earn crypto dividends and crypto interest. Right. So... It is still a very tricky space. Like Rev said, IAD is quite, it's all taxable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it may not be, but it's all needs to be thought yeah. through, unfortunately. Yeah, so if you do have it, it, it needs to mm-hmm. need to have a person who kind of knows the space and mm-hmm. what would be considered trading stock and what would kind of yeah. be considered long-term investments where that's, that's taxed very differently. Right. So Plus, yeah. um, you know, there was a call uh, to provide some guidance on salary and wages because some employees were actually requesting that they be paid in cryptos. Wow. Okay. So I had actually issued a ruling that, well, if you pay your employees in crypto, we're still de- expecting a cash yeah. payment of PAYE yeah, <laughs> deductions. Yeah. The IRD hasn't set up a crypto uh, deposit yet for them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, not, they're, not ex- they're not accepting their tax in crypto. Not no. yet. But no. I do have a crypto department. Wow. So. The world is changing. All right. We'll see how we've got time later on and we'll unpack a little bit more about the advisory group. But I'm keen to jump into some of the property tax changes that's taking place. So first of all, when we look at commercial property, what are you seeing change in this space? Uh, well, just just to revisit a bit of a background. So commercial property, we could depreciate them before 2010. Then what happened is the national government came in and they removed it, um, saying, well, the depreciation rate is going to be zero. Then what happened, COVID came along and we had the Labour government and they reinstated the depreciation for commercial buildings as part of their response to COVID-19 pandemic. So what that allowed, landlords were to claim depreciation at 2%, diminishing value method, or 1.5% straight line method. So as we all know, nothing is certain in life, especially when it comes to taxes. So the new government now is reverting back the depreciation rate to zero um, uh, for buildings with an estimated useful life of 50 years or more, uh, with effect from the 24, 25 and future income years. So in simple terms, what that means is for 31st March balance date taxpayer uh, is effective from 1st of April 2024. Right. So the depreciation Mm -hmm. rate goes back to zero. Right. And what about commercial fit-outs? Well, that's, that's, that's where the opportunities um, still exist because they can still be depreciated. Now, commercial fit-outs just includes not generally, it includes a non-st- non-structural items. 
part of the building. Um, you know, there's a special ruling for my idea. I believe it's about 50 pages. Um, um, you know, they talk about fit outs, um, what is covered, what is not. You know, so traditional things that might be included as a fit out is maybe some, you know, carpets, flooring, electrical work, security systems, air conditioning units, um, chattels, etc. So, you know, these items can be still captured separately um, in your books. They can be capitalized and depreciated. Now, some of these items carry some uh, significant depreciation rates. So it will be in your best interest to identify fit outs uh, when you're looking at um, acquiring a commercial property. Mm. So, what does all this mean for an owner of a commercial property? So, when you, when, I mean, I suppose the biggest thing is when you're purchasing a new commercial property now. So, what does all this mean there? So, we know depreciation rate is going to be zero for the structural right. items, right? Um, so, all it means is you have to make sure that when you're going through this uh, negotiation process is you can split out in the sale and purchase agreement what is the value of the land, what is the value of the building, and what is the value of the chattels and go further with chattels and identify what chattels have been acquired because different chattel carries different depreciation rate. So if you have a blanket just fed out, then you're stuck with a one rate for all the chattels. Mm -hmm. um, so back in 2021, there was a new rule came out. It, it's called purchase price allocation. So when someone sells an asset or business, the rules came in and said, well, the vendor and the seller has to agree on what assets has been bought and sold. Because what was happening in the past is uh, the vendor was uh, allocating the price differently across, uh, across the assets being sold. And the purchaser was allocating the price differently with the assets acquired. So a traditional problem in context of property was land, right? So land cannot be depreciated and everyone wants to allocate a higher piece to land. So it's a tax-free capital gain. Whereas the purchaser would, back then, when depreciation rates uh, were allowed on buildings, would allocate more to buildings, saying, okay, now I've got more tax deductions. So IRD saw that problem, mm -hmm. and back in 2021, they legislated um, that you have to agree to a price. So, you know, we, if, if you allocated $100 for an apple here, we'll see the flip. Right. Um, mm. So, now this creates a uh, issue for um, commercial properties. And now, for commercial properties, a purchase price allocation is compulsory uh, if the price is uh, in excess of one million dollars. Right. So, when when someone is selling a property uh, beyond one million dollars, the sale and purchase agreement needs to address all those issues. So, and it's not compulsory if uh, the the price ends up below one million dollars. But now, it will be in the buyer's best interest to negotiate mm -hmm. one allocation in the sale and purchase, regardless of the price. Right. Is the any sort of I guess final thoughts or opportunities that you see for this commercial space? Um, final thoughts um, on this one here is firstly, with the depreciation rate reverting back to zero, um, you know, consider what does it mean in terms of your tax liabilities coming up for 31st March 2025, terminal tax liability will go up and most likely your provisional tax will go up. So think about that, try and quantify that, fit it with your cash flow. Mm. Uh, the second thing is what we just talked about, the purchase price allocation. So regardless of the price, try and negotiate it, what will be the best outcome mm. for you. Mm. So it will never, um, you know, it, it might be a challenge, but you'll have to start that process and reach a middle ground most times. In, in most instances, you'll have to be reaching a middle ground with mm. the vendor. To, to, just to add to that, um, the purchase price allocation, if, if ones are not done, falls on the vendor first to get, to get one approved, Okay. Um, which they have to submit to IRD. If that's not done within a certain time frame, it then can fall to the purchaser, um, and they have to submit that to the IRD as well. Right. Yeah. So there's something to think about there if one's not done. Mm. Can, can end up to be a very awkward situation if you have to be doing this separately, because if the purchaser does it, um, because the vendor has not, then the the vendor will be stuck with that. Mm, yeah. So uh, it is something not to take lightly. 
hmm. <laughs> um, you know, get it straight. And the final thought on commercial property, I think what you have to remember with commercial space, there's still no loss ring fencing like we have in residential property, and we'll talk about that a bit later. There's no bright line test for commercial property. Again, we'll talk about the bright line a bit later. <laughs> and there's no restriction on interest deductibility right. at all. Mm-hmm. Like residential we have, but that's being phased in. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Raf, we'll move to residential then, throwing the ball to your court yeah. now. Doing and the hard one. Yeah, lots of conversations obviously recently around bright line tests. So first of all, give us give us a little bit of history and background and then help our listeners understand where and how and when is this bright line changing. Yeah, so um, people may be aware that um, bright line uh, test is changing uh, back to two years from the start of the 1st of July 2024. Which is a few weeks away. Someone listening doesn't even know what bright line is. No, right. So, yeah, so the bright line is um, when you buy a residential property, um, you could be required to pay tax on the sale if it's sold within a certain period. Currently, that period is set for 10 years um, and five years for new bills. Um, and that period is set to drop uh, to two years f- from the 1st of July 2024. Um, and so that takes into account the purchase purchase going simple here the purchase price date and then when it's sold and if that period is within that bright line period you could be paying tax on the sale of that property um yeah so so with the bright line i think the the key thing of it well i mean if you go back to the history it's been one of those tests it kind of deems that you bought a property with an intention of resale Mm, mm. uh, to make ird's life easier if you Mm -hmm. like you know so you know, uh, to avoid going into fights with taxpayers yeah. and say, why did you buy it? You sold it within a year. So from an IID's perspective, that w- that was fantastic. You know, like if you sold everything within two years, um, great. But then what has happened over the years, it's kept on changing. Two years became five years, five years became 10 years with an exemption for new build, which is five years. Mm-hmm. And, and it became very difficult to track. Um, you know, and so gone were the days when someone called you and said, hey, I've got a question. Is this subject to bright line mm-hmm. test? You know, you need to actually apply some thought now. Mm-hmm. So national government, as it promised, um, you know, he said, we're going to go back to the two year, but from 1st of July, 2024. Right. So we still need to be careful there. So if we had a sale and purchase agreement entered on 20th June, for example, but it settles after 1st of July, you're still stuck with the old rules. Right. So the start date is the day usually you sign. Mm. Um, not mm. sign, but when the uh, sale and purchase agreement is uh, presented and signed, not when it's settled mm. uh, per se there. So you need to be still careful. And uh, that's why there's been a lot of speculation in the media said that the listing will go up <laughs> from 1st of right. July. Mm. You know, because there would be a lot of properties that are most likely to be stuck in the 10 year. Uh, a bright line rule, which suddenly will fall back to two years. Mm. It really mucked up the Kiwi DIY person who used to love buying, you know, that house that needed a lot of work, mm. quickly turn it around in six months and make a profit. But actually, that was kind of their core business. You know, this killed that, didn't it? Yeah, core business. And and, and like you said, uh, I suppose it was part of Kiwi culture, wasn't it? Yeah, very much yeah. so. So, you know, it's a, it was more like a hobby too for some people. Um, you know, uh, someone who did have a passion about building and things, but that was not their daytime job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else we need to know about Brightline? Well, Brightline, well, the good thing is there's some rollover reliefs. What's that? What that means is sometimes I might have bought a property under my own name, but then I said, oh, maybe I should have put it under a trust right, or, or another structure. So what that rollover relief does is say, okay, in that case, yes, Aman, you can transfer your property to Aman Trust. And um, it, what that means is the trust is deemed to have acquired the property as the same date as I did mm-hmm. uh, at the same cost. So what for me, there's no bright line because I'm selling something. Uh, uh, at the same price. So there's no gain, there's no losses. Where And the trust actually gets the date I bought the property for right. at the same cost though. So 
the government has kind of realized that there are situation where people will want to move their property to another structure or there was a structure in place and they want to get it back. Now, I had a trust uh, that held my property, a rental property, but because the trust laws have become very complex with the trust tax rates mm-hmm. going up to 39% mm-hmm. and disclosure rules with beneficiaries um, and um, uh, all this additional compliance. So some people have been, oh, I want to wind my trust up, right? So without these rules, a trust will be deemed to have sold the property to me. And that could have been subject to the Brightline test. So right. what this rollover relief does is saying, well, no, we're getting it back to the settler of the trust, the person who set up the trust. So it will go back at the same date at the same cost. Right. So uh, there's some different structures this rollover relief can work with. Uh, look through companies, LTCs, which became popular for rental properties, and trust is the other one. Um, so going back and forth. Um, you know, makes it a bit easier. Mm. But it's just more to correct. I mean, this is not a tax dodge, if you like. Mm -hmm. It's more to correct where it should have been held in the first place. And everyone's situation is different, right? Um, Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Interest limitation rules. Talk us through that. Okay, so this one... Very hot, sexy topics tonight <laughs> for property matters. <laughs> so like uh, I said, with commercial property, thank God, we don't have these rules. Yes. So just going back uh, a while, what happened? So, you know, the, nas- um, so the national government is changing it. So what was the rules before? So the rules before was uh, very simple. <laughs> Everyone got a deduction for it. <laughs> then the Labour government decided to change everything and said, well, look, if you, if a, a property was acquired on or after 27th March 2021, you get zero deduction on interest. But if the, your property was acquired before 27th March 2021 and the loan, loan was drawn down before that date, then interest was kind of phased out. Um, so basically... To September 2021, it was 100%. March 2022, it was 75%. Then 31st March 2023, it drops still 75%. 31st March 24, 50%. Then if those rules were still in play, 2025, it would be 25%. And then from 2025, 1st of April 25 onwards, it would have been zero. What Mm -hmm. this government has done is saying starting from 1st of April, right 2024 Mm -hmm. you can claim now 80 percent of the interest deduction so they're facing it back in and this 80 percent applies to it's regardless when you drew down the loan before or after 27th march 2021 so you'll probably have a few investors out there at the moment who can't claim anything right (laughs) right but you know from this year first of april 2024 they can claim 80 percent and what's your thoughts and feelings on this? It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think uh, that's a sensible and um, tax legislation to have. Um, and just, just to complete the loop on that one, and then from 1st of April 2025, everyone can claim 100%. So mm. the reality is money is being borrowed, interest has been paid to buy a property which generates taxable income. So it's really silly not to allow that deduction, yeah. mm. right? I have a... F- very good friend of mine who's got a trust with one rental property um, um, and 31st March 2024, that's not changing. It's still 50% right. depending on when you drew down the loan. So if you drew the loan down before 27th March 2021, so for the year just ended, 31st March 2024, it was still 50%. Now that has thrown the trust with a tax liability with $6,000. Mm-hmm. And the trust doesn't have that money <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, it's really... Um, resulting from denying 50% deduction. Mm. So it is good. I think a lot of investors will be relieved um, uh, with this change, but there's probably two more years of pain, 31st March 2024 and 31st March 2025. And there's some exceptions to this rule? Yes. When it comes to, you know, build to rent developments, etc. Yeah, current exceptions. So if you have a new build... Um, uh, you you get to claim 100% of the interest um, regardless of when it was, was bought and um, that's one exception um, some other exceptions 
That's perhaps a better That's exception. Better, right. one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a new build. Um, yeah, that was just mainly to encourage people carry on building mm. <laughs> to allow mm. them. So you can see it was a bit unfair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People don't, I mean, to build, uh, to meet the definition of a new build, it was quite hard. You have to have, I believe, 20 uh, units uh, in one complex. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the new build was well, mostly, I think, on CV. So if your CV was, was um, not CV, code of compliance was done yeah. um, after March 21. Right. Um, that would define it as a new build. Okay. Yeah. What is this main home exemption? Main home exemption is um, applying for uh, the Brightline test. Um, so we, we spoke about the Brightline test a bit earlier. Um, so if you've got a home and that's the main home you live in, um, and if you're selling it to buy another home to live in, ah. then you're not going to pay tax on, yep. on that at all. Because it's not being used for investment purposes. Exactly, yep. yep. And and that's a sensible one to have. Yeah, but the rules have been changing on that as well. So mm-hmm. before 27th March 2021, the main home exclusion, um, you know, uh, operated on an all or nothing basis. So as long as you use the home for more than 50% of the time as your main home, uh, and when you sold sold it, if you sold it, it's uh, you could get the exemption. Then the rules changed that if you bought uh, property after 27 March 2021, um, the main home exclusion applied only for the period you used the land uh, or the property as the main home. So, um, so what could have happened is you might have a main home and you used it for a period of time in a year, and then you went uh, overseas for a career break for five months, and the homes. Uh, remain vacant that period there right. so that created some mm. um, you know like does the re- uh, home main home exemption mm. apply to you well the good thing is it's changing back to the old rules there's as long as you use it more than 50% uh, of the time as your main home then you'll qualify right and that ch- that's uh, changing from 1st of July 2024 now before we went on air and we were talking about the bright line test something that caught my attention you you said there's some interesting things around selling after the bright line period yes so you know it's all good that the bright line period ends and you say okay i can sell my house so some of the things you still need to be careful about is one if you bought the property with the intention of resale and if that intention has been crystallized in a Mm. document with your bank or your lawyer uh, it does not matter when you sell it um, you know, whenever you sell it, whatever the period is, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the track, mm-hmm. any gain will be taxable because you bought it with an intention of resale. Right. The other thing uh, people need to be careful about is have you established a regular pattern of buying and selling? Then IRD mm-hmm. loves to see that, um, you know, as a trader, uh, even though you're not officially in uh, yeah. in that business. Uh, the other one is association. This is what some people, you'll hear some people saying tainted. The property is tainted. So if you're associated with a property developer, builder, at the time you've acquired it, when you sell it, uh, within 10 years, you know, uh, and none of the exemptions apply, like main home for argument's mm. sake, um, there they could be a taxing event as well. So what the Brightline test has done is actually made the tax rules around property more complex Mm. (laughs) there's not one thing you have to think about (laughs) a nice segue in a minute to talk about where your company comes in to help people because you know there's a lot of rule changes and a lot of Mm. information so that's where the experts come but before we do was there any final thoughts or opportunities when it came to the residential property management side well i suppose the 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 good side with um, the, the positive is we will get the interest deductibility back so, you know, I talked about my friend as an example. So hopefully mm-hmm. <laughs> in a few years' time, he won't have that much tax to pay uh, on his small rental property that he has. Um, the bad news, if you like, we're still stuck with this um, concept of um, ring fencing of losses. Right. So basically what that means is if your residential property has incurred a loss, a net loss for the year, we cannot offset that against other income right? and maybe claim a refund uh, for tax paid on that other income, such as PAYE. So what we have to do is carry forward that losses 
and we can only use that losses against residential income uh, under the property uh, pro- uh, rental income or maybe any bright line income you've got mm. uh, so if you had another pro- property that you sold and you got a bright line taxable gain then you could use those losses to offset the tax payable on the bright line gain um, the the other concept the final thought on this one here is like I said earlier the rules are becoming quite complex um, what doesn't help is the flip-flops you know two years five years ten years two years mm. <laughs> this is your main home exemption back then it is now we're going back to the old ways so keeping just keeping in touch or just you know where the legislation is it's not very easy and uh, it's one of those uh, questions if someone is selling a residential property you need to address all these mm. questions yeah um and before <laughs> before uh, gone are the days, you know. I remember when I started my career, if someone had a investor had a rental uh, property, hmm. very simple procedure, give me your rental income, rental deductions, and that's the end of the story. Yeah. Now we've got one million and one questions yeah. that we have to resolve. Yeah, and just on that, um, uh, it's probably best if you're thinking about buying or selling just to give your accountant a quick call. Yeah. No harm in doing that. They're more than happy to take it. Mm. Um, and they could probably advise if anything you need to, to worry about. That's mm. why we hire the experts. Now, um, Raf, before we went on here, you talked a little bit about Airbnb, something that's sort of come into your world, because I guess there's quite a few perhaps investors or, or just that mum and dad investor that's, you know, renting out a part above the garage or something as an Airbnb. Where do we sit tax-wise with that? Yeah, um, got to be very careful with Air- Airbnbs um, these days. Um, one of the scary things is, is that um, if you're making more than $60,000 um, in income from an Airbnb, um, it could require you to register for GST. Right. Um, and registering for GST also brings your property into the GST net. Right. Um, and that can be very scary for some people because um, when you do bring that property and you bring it in, that, you can claim a, a GST deduction for cost. But when you sell the property, you'd have to pay the GST on, on the market value that you sold it for. And given, given how Auckland's gone or the <laughs> property market's gone, um, that could be double or triple the amount you, you originally bought it for. So something to consider there when um, you're going for Airbnb. Um, that, that's, um, mm, brilliant. Yeah. Mm. Now, I've only got a minute left, so no pressure, Aman, but you've got a minute. Tell us about the advisory group and how people, how you can help people. Well, like I said, advisory group is a, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a accounting practice with uh, multiple disciplines. Um, so we are able to cater for um, everyone's need. Um, our, our, our clients range from small to medium businesses to large enterprises, including offshore businesses. Uh, we now deal with a lot of complex um, transactional issues. Uh, we are seeing a big intake um, from foreign clients into the commercial space in particular. Um, so, um, you know, we're here to help you with the dedicated tax team that we have, um, which uh, most practices outside mm. do not have, uh, uh, creates a added uh, plus, if you like. Yeah. And I see, you know, you promote yourself for strategic advice, succession planning, but also buying and selling a business, but also come in and talk to us as the troubleshooters. So if you are having an issue, I guess you've got a wealth of experience and that's the place to go. How can people get in touch and find out more? Well, uh, we'll have some material up on your website <laughs> in your podcast, but at the end of the day, um, it just just search us, the advisory group. Um, you, will, um, you will come to the right place. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. And a, a great place to stay informed and get all the information. Hey, thank you so much, guys. Honestly, that has gone so fast. I said before we came on here, 40 minutes, you just blink and it's done. And that's, that's happened. Thanks for unpacking all of that information in a way that all our listeners can understand. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you again sometime soon. Yeah, thank Boris, you for, thank having, you for us. having us. Thanks for tuning in today, guys. Have a fabulous short week and Matariki weekend. We will catch you next next week where we have some great health coaching for leaders and for all you busy people out there which you might need after a long weekend take care catch you next week